Hello, Neil, and everybody else watching this, and welcome to number four. Is this number four of the the series? And uh, we have an interesting show today on, uh, well, we're going to start talking about our own interpretations of the tarot, and we're going to work through the, the major arcana all through the rest of this program, the series, I mean, and we'll also have some, we're going to bring in Neil's vast knowledge of the cat bars, uh, at the, the first part of it, as we're going to be talking about the concept of dualism today. Now, before we get that, we'd like to start with a little bit of a, a current events thing. And uh, we've gone back to a, a strong, a, a severe lockdown here now, basically because I think they've just taken seasonal flu numbers and sexed them up to make them all sound like COVID-19 numbers. But if you look at the numbers compared to previous flu number years, it's actually about the same. So it's just one more example of uh, giving any excuse they can to put to stop people from getting out and doing things. I think they're probably a bit nervous about New Year's Eve kind of like breakout that people would get so drunk on New Year's Eve and then hit the streets, and uh, that, not because of their the COVID, because they would have lost control of them. How is it over there at the moment? Well, as far as uh, lockdown, we've done the same thing. Uh, straight into tier four. I mean, they, they've got this. They've got the new Oxford um, prick. <laughs> uh, but uh, sort of, you said, okay, we 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 finally got there. Every, all the, the news is uh, jubilant, really, with this news, and it's all really good. So we're going to get out of everything. But it's because it's so good, we've been put into tier four, which basically is the top, the top tier. Now they're talking about tier five. I don't know what that's going to be. But, yeah, tier four, but it doesn't make any difference because the, the restaurants and the bars and the cafes are all closed here anyway. So we just, we just locked down the, further. Oh, then they've never been happier with this. It's given them so much power. And you can see they're actually drunk on it. They're mm. actually drunk on power. And it's used for, it's being, here it's being used to hide all kinds of political, I'm sure it's the same in England, all kind of political, uh, you know, rubbish and things they want to do and it just gives politicians and senior civil servants a chance to control people but in 2021 i can't see them continuing this far as much longer i know they have a lot of people terrified and everything but I, I just can't see it going on much longer i can't see them benefiting much further from if the, if the idea is to close down small business and to grab market share then i don't think there's any point in carrying on well about that thing about um about uh, hiding things, uh, you know, what's, what's going on in the background. Of course, we had the Brexit thing go through, uh, which I've got to admit, I, my interest in Brexit was eclipsed long ago by, by the fact that they shut their business down. But there are, there are one or two things which I, I'll just mention. Um, so we've got a free trade deal. That's that's a good thing. We'll just get this out of the way, because I know people in uh, in the US who are not going to be interested in this, and probably yourself, but. Uh, oh, so that's they, would, they would be surprised. They would be interested. But go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we've got like we've got a free trade deal, and this, which is a good thing for everybody concerned, I think, because uh, it's less control. I think anything that has less control has got to be good. We've got four years. We're under, still under the European uh, Court of uh, Justice. Or anything, any anything, any sort of um, legislation to do with trade is governed by that. We've got four years. And this four years, we can either go further out or we can just decide to go right back in. You know, like we said, there's, uh, we were talking about the um, Hotel California that you can check out and never leave. Well, we've left, but we've kept the key card and it can reactivate it at any point. So that's, that's a bit dodgy. Well, the main thing for me, especially as a tour operator, is that we've they've decided on travel within the EU and we're allowed... For the, anybody from the UK can travel in the EU for 90 days visa free, and then after that you just need to get a visa. So to me, so to me that's perfect. Yeah, it doesn't so, really affect yeah. people. Yeah, unless, so, unless they want to live there or something. The question is now: What is Mr. Jack Boots Johnson going to do? That's what I've been wondering. Will he um, will he use the the new uh, vaccine options? Oh, <laughs> the new um, Oxford deal to to will he use that as his get out of jail free card and disappear, or will he stay to cover his tracks? So that that's still in the in the balance, isn't it? 
Well, here That's in our here in Ireland, the, the, the Brexit thing is a very big deal because UK is Ireland's biggest trading partner. And you buy most of your agricultural produce from us. And so it's a big deal here for farmers. And then, but there's also a thing called the Anglo-Irish Agreement, which oh, goes back on. to like 1921. Mm. There's no, that supersedes the EU. So it, Brexit wouldn't, if it was a full hard Brexit, the prob Brexit it would, probably wouldn't have affected Ireland as severely as, say, France. But uh, they're already talking now that you're going to have to fill out customs forms if you send packages to the UK and that kind of thing. So uh, you can see that the EU is also trying to goad Ireland into a trade yeah. war with the UK. They want that. Uh, that would wreck our, that would destroy our economy. It would be a, be a nightmare for us. Uh, so, but it's like you can see the EU are they they're going to try and play Ireland and the UK off against each other with yeah. this whole thing, yeah. just to just to you know just to wave their fist and mm. spiteful. Definitely. What they did, what they did about using Northern Ireland as a bargaining chip, is nothing short of evil, really. After all those years trying to get peace and everything settled down, to just to bring that, to use that as a tool to bargain was just, wow, well, just totally wrong, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, look what we're dealing with. Look what we're dealing with. Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And we still got the EU election. Sorry, the the US election. Not a hundred percent certain. Well, apparently, Mike Pence, the vice president, has a constitutional ability to cancel the election on grounds at the last, at like the midnight hour. And this has happened before in the past. And so there are kind of, you know, legal statutes that can be whipped out and constitutional provisos that can be whipped out to cancel the election. It seems very interesting. I mean, the, the Democrat side definitely seem to have lost their vigor and they're no longer calling themselves, you know, acting like they own the White House. I've noticed that. And they're, they've, they've gone very quiet where Trump seems to be singing and dancing as more than ever. So who knows? Who knows? This is the, what, what the grand chessboard there has for anybody. Well, absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose what it means that we're, we're moving into the next year after an awful year, but there are things still not quite settled that war is still going on but i'll tell you what just a, something a bit of a loop out um i was looking at uh, watching dave cullen's show last night and it was um what was it how is this a thing and um, just about the uh, oxford thing yeah. they, they, he showed the um, definition on the who's website of our herd immunity i don't know if you've seen this oh, and no. the yeah, well, the, the, for years, for time memorial, um, they had a definition of herd immunity, which is what we've been basically doing for hundreds of thousands of years, actually catching a virus, spreading it until you get to the point where there's a certain amount of people have got it. And, um, and then there's a barrier, so the, the virus reduces. And just literally a few days ago, they've changed it to herd immunity is a result of a vaccination program. <laughs> just blatant. Just like... <laughs> uh, ah, gaslighting, yep. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Have you got any more... Um, I can't think of anything else that's that's um, happening yeah. at the moment. It's that time of the year when things are, are really... You know, Parliament's gone home, and the news is not talking about anything. No, it's uh, it's uh, it is you know because it just goes to show you how much of the news is manufactured, you know it really does. Yeah, if we, it's, it's always an hour a day. <laughs> if politicians didn't exist, we wouldn't have news anymore. We'd have what the old-fashioned days, what they call tidings, tidings. You know that's what we'd have, but we wouldn't have news <laughs> anymore. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, out of out of the uh, the material world, because this Precise. is actually this is actually. A, good, a theme of this show in many ways we're dealing with the concept of dualism and uh, before yeah. we get into that uh, actually it's a good segue to we're going both, ne both Neil and I are very interested in the tarot and uh, for lots of reasons and we both have made videos on the tarot and we've decided to do a series on the major arcana and basically uh, one of the, I, I, I know it sounds weird but it's most there's not too many men talking about the tarot online so uh it's it's kind of to sort of demystify it for all all, all people that mm -hmm. this is not just a, a, a thing for ladies and women and why well, not to say that anymore but uh, but for but, but it's for everybody it's for everybody because it is a 
a pictorial, you know, gateway into the subconscious. And it's a very useful thing for anyone. And so we starting with the very first card, and I'm going to let Neil kick off on this one. We're going to talk about, Neil, you're going to talk about your reaction upon your holding uh, Il Mato La Mat, the Fool card. Aha. Uh -huh. This is my, this, this is the right away one. And this is the classic Italian one, the Baroque one. Just like, yeah, he's facing the other way. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, I like what you said, a gateway to the subconscious, because that's ex exactly what it is, isn't it? And uh, I think rather than, see, I, I don't do divination with it. It's a process of the ancient mystery teachings that I, that I follow. And rather than um, telling your future, it's more like creating your future, if you see what I mean. Uh, so there it is again. There's the tarot. There's the uh, right awake, uh, right awake fool. Stood on the uh, hill looking out. Uh, now, we have a, a tableau, a tarot tableau of the major arcana. And it doesn't matter that you can't see the pictures that well, but there it is anyway. And you'll see that our fool is right up above and, importantly, away out of the whole, um, out of the whole main body of the tarot. Uh, so, the fool. Okay, now the, main, the ancient mysteries are where, where I come from. And you, you come from uh, more of a pagan uh, point of view, I think. Is that would you say that's right or no? Yeah, Indian psychology and yeah, okay, yeah. logical type things. Yeah. So hopefully, by the end of our tour, we'll realise that the, the the connection between those two is amazingly. It, it's the same thing, really, because when you get down to any any truth, it's all going to be the same, isn't it? Otherwise, it won't be true, I suppose. <laughs> um. Now I've got it. I've got a playlist. I'm going through the, the major arcana in, in much more detail on my on my uh, YouTube channel. So this is like a, a, pre, a shortage, a preceded version of it, really. Um, so the first thing is they all have a number, and the number for the fool is naught, uh, and that can be called uh, the cosmic egg. So the cosmic egg being uh, the universal life force. Anything can be created from it all that sort of thing. Uh, the name, the fool itself, is the Latin, the follis, which is the windbag. So the windbag is always, um, is the fool, isn't it? The, the guy who, uh, who's, who appears to be a fool because he's maybe talking too much. There's a, there's a, Plato had um, a, a saying, and I'm just trying to remember it now, it was something like those who uh, see through the truth or the lies of our society, of your own society, will never be, uh, will always be disbelieved and regarded as a fool, more or less. So basically the fool is the person who is hiding as a fool, but really can see uh, what, what the truth is. Uh, now he stood on it. So what we're, what we're doing, what we're saying here is he's just returned from a journey a life journey, a cosmic journey, because uh, he's on a hill, he's on a, he's on a height, but he's looking out and he's looking above and, uh, uh, and forward to the next height above up here, because that's his next journey. He's about to set on another spiritual quest, another spiritual journey. But he's also got, so but he's got to go down in the valley before he does. So he's got to go down in the valley and up like you do when you're, when you're hill walking, obviously you do that, which is saying basically that you're going to go through like I, I suppose I did really. I was saying that when the, all this rubbish started that we're going through now, I went through a really bad time, like the dark side, the dark, dark night of the soul. And uh, that's in a way you've got to think, well, this is good. I'm suffering now. That means I'm about to start another journey and climb another hill and uh, get to be the hermit at the top. And uh, hopefully that's my next journey. So he's about to set off on his journey. He's actually got one step left. And that is just saying basically there that, or it falls off. And that is saying basically that um, if you, no matter how far you go in your, in your spiritual journey, there's always one more step. You never get to the end of your, uh, of your potential, really. Yeah, right mm -hmm. the way around, like the, the cosmic egg again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he's got 
Let's have a look. Can we just, I'll just point a couple of things out. He's got a red, he's got a, a white rose. So that means desire. So he's, and roses in the tarot always, always represent desire. Red rose is active desire. So white rose is purified desire. So it, he's got that desirous quest. He wants to go, he's ready to go off on his next journey. Blah, 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 blah. Um, the sun, by the way, at the back is the, is Kethet, the, uh, the top uh, sephir of the Kabbalistic tree. He's got, I won't go into too much detail because there's no, at this point, but he's got his, uh, this is his memory. He's got a little sack here with an eye on it. Now that's his memory. Okay, which means he's been on previous journeys and memory is wisdom. So he's, keep, he's keeping his wisdom on a stick. He's not keep, but he's not wrapped round him. He's not full of it. He's keeping it if he needs it. His wand is that he means he can measure the the, the past. Uh, he's got a dog here. Now dog dogs are uh, intelligence because they're, they're supposed to be um, adapted by mankind. But he's not being led by the dog. The dog's at his heel. So he's off on his on his next journey, his next uh, 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 quest. But he's got his intelligence, which he's carrying lightly. He's got his, he's got his memories with him. He's got his desire, and um, and he's ready to walk down into the the valley of the valley of uh, fear. So I'm 23. Even though I walk through the valley, uh, the shadow of the valley of death, I fear no evil. Um, so basically, without yeah, I don't want to go into much more detail, but. Um, that's what it is. It's the beginning of the quest. After that, you get into the major, uh, the other the other cards where things start getting serious. But uh, he basically basically represents the cosmic everything, the prima materia that everything is made out of. Well, that do. Well, I would agree with all that, of course. Um, but the the beauty of the tarot is the ability to uh, apply symbolic interpretations on top of the entire architecture, the, the, on the fundamental architecture of the card. So this is the Italian classical deck, about 200 years old. It's about this, not the deck, not the cards. I mean, the deck itself was designed. It was a, it's, it's one of the older ones. It's not too, too far off the, the creation of the Tarot de Marseille and the Swiss Tarot. And here we have El Mato, the Fool. Now, again, it is zero so it's not of this material world yet, but it's on the cusp of it. As, as Carl Jung said, the, the infant ego on the birth of consciousness. Now, so if you think about this, the impetus to actually make him go on his journey would be that subconscious prodding or imperative that comes from the daemon or the genius or the, the, the subconscious mind that sets him off on his way. Yeah, my white rose. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Now he's again. I agree with the, that's true. He's carrying a bag full of his his experiences from his previous life. If you were to look at this as an in, in terms of reincarnation, that's the that's the fleeting memories of his past life, as you said, memories and experiences that will come up through a subconscious mind in moments of danger that will give him the insightful insights into things that that problems as they arise. So it's almost like a bag of experience. But as you said, he's not tied down to it. It's strapped over on a stick over his shoulder. So he's not weighed down by the, the, the memories of his past life or his past cycle. But he has them there in repository just in case it's needed. In this card, he's dressed kind of similar to a harlequin. That would be so similar to the fool of the jester elements of thing. And that shows his innocence, his childlike innocence, that there's a, 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 a blank chest, a blank a blank board here, a blank sheet of paper from which he begins to uh, assemble new experiences within this new cycle, the, as you said, the cosmic egg, the Orphic egg, and so on. And within all this, the prima materia is which he's suspended, which is the whole matter of everything. This one, he's not walking towards the edge of a cliff. He's doing something else. He's looking at the, the person reading the card or viewing the card. So he's not paying attention to the path in front of him, but he's also so he, he, he has this, this. This is the whole thing of like throw caution to the wind, but don't be a fool. But he's also looking back at us to say to us, to like you know, this is you, you, you are me. We will be this. You will you will face this journey. You will come along here with me. 
Now, the dog, I think, is the most important aspect of this card because the dog, the dog represents the material world, the animalistic world. Also, the ability for man to tame the natural world. A dog is a, basically a wolf that's been made into a pet. And the dog is warning him as much as anything else. The dog is an important character in all this because the dog, as, as much as your subconscious, well, your conscious mind is saying to you, embark on this journey, go on the hero's journey, go on this path, you must be aware of dangers. So you have a dog, he sniffs the way, he sniffs dangers and this kind of thing. So he's, this is as much as we have a spiritual lofty sense of self, the dog reminds us of our animal instincts and that we need our ego. The dog is very much representative of the ego in this to keep us going safely along the path because the rules of the subconscious world are not necessarily the rules of the natural world. That's fantastic. So again, and, and again, he's, he's come back to zero, but he's not actually in the, as you said, in that, that chart you showed, he's not in the main body of the tarot because again, he's more, he's more connected to the genius or the subconscious mind, the, the daemon than he is to the, the following and, you know, the conscious, the, the, real world elements and archetypes that follow this you know he hasn't even become dualistic yet although this one he has a beard and he's a man remember he's a fool he's a harlequin so he's not like a he's not a forceful man he's not a strong man and that's the purpose of the dog the dog compensates for this element of you know you, you, he has his wits about him he has his charisma he has his past life experiences in the bag or his past cycle experiences in the bag, but he also carries a stick, a walking stick can be seen as a weapon, and he has the dog. So the lower part of the subconscious poles here represents the material conscious world, where his head represents the lofty subconscious world of ideals. And the path forward is obviously the, the continual movement of creation that without, without movement and without beginning cycles again, there can be no universe of any kind. Yeah, I tell you that that was pretty similar, more similar than I thought it, it would it, be to my. Just using different language, but it's it's yeah. it's, it's, it's identical, really. It is, yeah. Uh, I yeah. think, and you, the Plato quote. I always think of uh, the Plato's allegory of the cave. It's the he's the one who stepped out of the cave mm. on beginning his new personal journey, where he's then a fool. Now, now the modern interpretation yeah. of a fool is not the same as the original meaning the original meaning of a fool just meant someone it could be almost like a good thing oh you're a fool for love or you know mean that you tro went in, in you know you threw yourself right into it or you know you're foolhardy that you 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 throw yourself into into situations and and things like that are, are challenging so you know it's only in recent decades centuries that the term the fool has been associated with being an imbecile or something like that but that's not the original meaning the original meaning of the fool is the imperative that jumps you out of security and safety and into a new a new adventure. And yeah, and, and it couldn't be more prescient to our times, could it? Stating we, we we've got to start off on a new adventure, and I think a lot of people after this year we've had are uh, right on the the brink of uh, setting off. Is he on a flat? It's a wonderful car. That is he on a, a flat? He's uh, on a, flat, he's a flat landscape, but he's not yeah, paying attention. Look at them both together. I'll put mine on. They, they are very, yeah. very similar, aren't they? Yeah. The, I, I've always thought the, the addition of the, the, the precipice by Alice Waite. Is that her name? Was that her name? Yeah. Oh, no, no. Arthur. He was a guy, yeah. Arthur Waite. Yeah, uh, that was, always, that was a, a very good uh, addition to the card, showing the cliff, the precipice. Because one more step and he's got he's over, but it's exactly, it yeah. See, which is like which is saying, be very, very careful, watch yeah. what you're doing, but uh, you vote, but don't stop. Yeah, there's loads of these traditions are common everywhere. There's like there's stories in Japanese mythologies of, of you know, people making journey to learn trades and things like mm. that. Whereas, you know, there'd be a story of a boy who wanted to learn how to make a uh, be a carpenter and in order to become the carpenter he'd have to take a long journey down 
a, you know, a long road down to, to, to Japan and like along the way in, she would encounter like a temptress or a, mm. a samurai who was very nasty or someone who stole his money. So it's very, it's a very universal thing. And also there was the, um, within uh, this mythologies created about the ancient sculptors and, and uh, of classical pagan world, a uh, classical Rome, and there's lots of stories and Greece of you know a famous person seeing the a shepherd, and nearly always a shepherd boy, in the uh, field, and it turns out to be some great artist like Giotto or someone like that. And this is the beginning of the journey that took them from being a shepherd boy, in, in you know droving sheep in a field, on onto greatness, producing the great art artwork of the world. And it's, again, the imperative step out of the field and become mm. what you're meant to be. I suppose the people he meets on the journey are yeah. all part of the psychological adventure, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I imagine, like, in the mystery schools, you know, that, w w the mystery school stuff, that, the, the angle you're coming from, is very, very strongly rooted in, in sort of, like, symbolic metaphor going back right mm. to ancient Egypt, where the... The, the, the side that I'm coming from, the more European end of it, would be very laced with mythology. It's, you know, like sagas and stories, where yeah. the one that you do is more of a kind of a codified world, where, you know, you talk about things like prima materia. And that does show up all through it, and um, things like that. And the, the, cos the Orphic Egg, the Cosmic Egg, the Aqua Nostra, all this kind of thing. That goes back right back to Hermeticism and into ancient oh, yeah. Egypt. That's exactly you know, so what it is. Yeah, but isn't it interesting that the two the two different strands, all the different strands, everything from Native American to African, they all boom coming together to the same. You could show that to an African shaman, a neotech, an Illotech shaman in Africa, and he, he he would look at that and go, "Oh, and and you could explain it just like we are explaining yeah, it yeah, yeah. Uh, within the 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 sort of psychic architecture of his own culture." If you, I mean, and then you say, well, where, where does the root of it come from? Because, uh, and then back, back to the whole megalithic thing, you, people are always saying, you know, how did they move these stones and how, and all these big questions? And then we've got to say, well, was there in the past some sort of sort of pre-advanced uh, technical um, civilization that knew of um, knew of the physics that we don't know of? Because when you when you're saying uh, um, any idea, like for instance, like if you would have the old um, metal workers, the um, blacksmith, uh, he was thought of as a magician. Because yeah. I mean, this guy brings metal, metal yeah. shiny objects out of rock. Yet when when you know when you realise the which obviously we do now the the, the physics behind it, it's science. So you can say a lot of magic, as we know, and a lot of the, um, a lot of the, um, uh, the archetypal ideas are all seem to be magic now, well, because we seem to have forgotten the yeah, fundamental yeah. physics behind it. Uh, well, you think of the alchemical nature of the Smith in the dark, with the sparks flying and changing almost what seems to a human being an impossible metal. And there's so much mythology around smithing. There's a smith god in Ireland called the Goban Sayer, who's a pagan god who was supposed to have built the all, all the churches for St. Patrick. But what they're really telling us is that they stole them all from the pagans. And there's also the two, the two dwarf smiths in the Thor legend of the hammer, when the fly, the fly bit him as he was casting the hammer, and the hammer was too small. The hammer, Thor's hammer, ended up Mjolnir with a, a small handle because of a mistake, because of a distraction from the magical process of casting it. And it was a great metaphor there for magic in general. Now, bringing us back to the metaphor and to the megaliths and the rock art, I'm going to talk about rock art in particular. In particular. Like we saw on Long Meg and all over Ireland, we have this and uh, Scotland, the spirals, right? Yeah, oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the same kind of thing as this. I mean, you think about it, starting yeah. with the middle of the, the outside. If the spiral in a flat plane goes towards the center, but if you imagine that in 3D space time as it's going into the stone, it goes like this down to a point, and that would be the, the world card, and then spins back out again. And if you saw that straight on, all you would see is a symbol, yeah, a single yeah. spiral. When you project that into 3D space, you have a cone that descends 
to the point of zero again and then expands back out again yeah. ad infinitum. So it's on as, as above, so below on every level. Because we're told, bringing it back down to the, uh, the tarot level, is that um, you go on your journey. Um, so you would, like, like, you, like you see here, he's been down into the valley, but he's only here. Next step, he's got to go down to the valley and up to there, then down. So at the end of every at the end of every journey, you end up a little bit higher. Then you've got to go lower and up. So eventually, you you get to the point where your valley is higher than your original peak. So that is actually a spiral, but it's not a yep, circle. Yeah. Like we say, it's a circle. We're going on a circular journey, but it's actually a spiral because you're getting higher and higher and higher and not as low every time. So yeah, that, is like the, the that is the journey of life. Sine wave up down up down you know yeah. and an analog sine wave up the, the amplitude attack decay attack decay and we also don't know for sure what's ahead of them in either part we don't we don't see what's here we don't see what's here right we don't know and that's the whole point of life it's the grand mystery yeah. and he doesn't know either or this yeah. person because I say it's not it's not a male or a female it is endogenous because it's yeah, uh, he's, it, he's, it hasn't come he, into creation he, yet, even though it is every, he, even though it's all creation, it hasn't formed yet. The infant ego, you know, awaiting birth into consciousness and define whatever archetype he is, and that we're going to be just, actually the program today is going to be very heavily on a lot of these kinds of things. He's androgynous, right? So he's a, a pre. Well, this one has a beard, but he's a pre. He's a he's a he's a person. Say pu is in pu on the cusp of puberty or something like that, or a baby about to be born. The chromosomes mm. haven't fully developed, and the thing, this kind of thing, we don't know the gender yet. So yeah, it's fascinating too. But it's also the, it's also he doesn't know who he is yet. He doesn't really know who he is yet. And his jo his job and his journey is to 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 is one of self discovery. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, definitely, yeah. Of a, an archetypal psyche that's that's of his own, and that's very important because this is one of the reasons totalitarian regimes, things like yeah, you know, Marxism, Bolshevism, uh, mm. uh, National Socialism, it's about the destruction of the self. Yeah, that, the yeah, yeah, that you yeah. there's no difference between you and anyone else. Yeah, you are literally just one of the the blob of the whole, and if you this is to the stop. This is to, if you've had one, this is to stop you from having an integrated psyche with a sense of self. And this is what the card really tells you that that's the most important thing you are be who you're meant to be. And that sort of idea of a, an integrated psyche, I think, is very important uh, because going into the, the idea of, go, of where evil comes from, uh, I, I, it seems to me that the Orthodox Church doctrines. Are designed to stop you um, realizing that they blame something else for evil all the time. Uh, I know there was a story of the fall, but that was kind of mis misinterpreted. But it's like instead of saying, "Oh, evil is in you," it's always somebody else. It's the devil's fault. It's the demiurge. It's somebody else, and that can that can be quite dangerous. I really think that because how can you deal with something until you recognize it? You've got to form the problem, haven't you, before you can before you can find a solution to it. Well, now we're in the we're in the the, the world of du dualism here, mm -hmm. spiritual dual, philosophical dualism, and it's it's so common across all spiritual and philosophical traditions, and it's uh, incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. But the, oh, yeah. the whole thing it seems to be evolved. It's it it comes from the concept of there has you know the, everything from the yin and yang to the the good and evil of Christianity. There's a million of ways of interpreting it. I find now your your speciality, although I, I know a bit about it, would be something like the Cathars. The Cathars were definitely a dualist Christian set, the good Christians, a dualist Christian mystical sect. Very came out of like Neoplatonism and very similar to groups like the Bogomils who sort of preceded yeah. them. And the, the belief, now, from what I got it, the belief of the Cathars was that there was the material world, which was, a cent they basically had a Gnostic thing, which was basically a, 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 a kind of a, 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 a repository of everything that was wrong with humanity and materialized as a form that you had to make the most of. And this was 
it's almost a, 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 a creation of God, the spiritual force of God and the Demarouge in conflict. Uh, the Demarouge was the one who has you grounded in the, in the, in the material, in the suffering, uh, in the what they call the gunas in Hinduism, the inclinations of man, the innate behaviors. And where God or the good Christian aspect of it was about this, you know, finding a balance with that. Was, would I be correct in saying that? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it really goes back to this, this age old question is what is evil and what is the source of evil? Because once you've got uh, Christianity, um, I mean, this goes back thousand thousand right to the Zoroastrianism, which is like uh, like two and a half, three thousand years ago. Uh, so a thousand years before we know, and probably much much further than that, because it's a, it's a fundamental philosoph- philosophical question, isn't it? Where does evil come from? And um, so the the idea is like, okay, so God's created the world. God is good. God is omnipresent. He's all perfect. Uh, he's all powerful. So if that's, if that's so, why in this world did it, that he created is there so much evil everywhere? And that was the sort of that was the that's where it comes from. It's that it's that Joel, oh, it's a it's a duopoly, isn't it? So what he's kind of thinking, well, why if everything's good, how is why is this evil? It doesn't make any sense. That and that's a question that has been lying there. So what what the Jewish decided was that if God wasn't if, uh, if God was perfect. He couldn't have created the world. And so basically the idea it was the devil or the demiurge that created the whole of matter and God is out of it. Um, yeah, then they split yeah. it up again to say that, okay, then so if that's the case, this demiurge, if God created everything, how can there be a devil? And a, or, so the, the first idea, there was the fallen angel. Um, and, and then, but the pure, and that he created with a pure sort of dualism, uh, all, all, the, all the dualistic sects have always been split again into it was God created the fallen angel or there's two beings, there's a devil and there's a God or there's an evil and there's a good. And, and that is basically um, that is basically the beliefs on a very basic level of the, that's why you end up with dualism. Yeah, but yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, it's difficult, isn't it? Because um, you, you, can apply, you can apply, apply anything to dualism because I think like if you look at the, the Zoroastrian and the Neoplatonic element of dualism, it's a belief that the two opposing forces aren't necessarily evil. It's just that this opposing force considers that one to be evil and that opposing force considers this one to be evil. And in between the boat is the, the, the consciousness of man making a philosophical decision of what means what, who is it, and then the philosophical discourse coming out of that. So where you could have, you know, I think uh, the, this idea of something being absolutely evil and absolutely good is quite, again, it's not, it's, not a mo- it's not an ancient belief. You wouldn't have had it in places like ancient Egypt. You certainly didn't have it in the pagan world. There was often sympathy for the, the fallen gods mm. or this kind of thing that there was, a, you know, and if you bring it back to the megaliths, okay, you have the stones around the circle. But where the action really takes place is not the stones themselves, but the negative space where the, in between them, in the center of the circle, where there are no stones. And mm. that would be seen as the dualistic opposing force of the stones themselves. So like our ancient ancestors, like I said, with the spiral and the, the fool, they, had, they were very psychologically highly developed in their own way too. In Hinduism, there's a, there's a very interesting concept of dualism. It, 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 based on the idea, it's called Samkhaya, and sam, Samkhaya means that there are two opposing forces in, in, in the universe. One is called, uh, what's it called now? Parakarti, I think it's called. And the other one is called Parusa. And Parakarti represents matter. And Parusa represents consciousness. And the, 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 the battle or the conflict between these two dual states mm. creates a thing called Jiva. And Jiva is the sense of the self. So it's very, very, very similar to what you get in Neoplatonism and other kind of other dualist forms, dualistic concepts like Zoroastrianism of uh, yeah, yeah. If the conflict creates the person, the conflict yeah. creates the self, you know, yeah. between yeah. the what I mean, you call 
and evil, but it's really opposing forces of matter and consciousness. Yeah, I mean, it's what uh, I see as uh, not dualism, but dualistic teachings, uh, which is what I personally believe, and that's why it goes back to why I think that the Church have crossed it out, to the fact that there's, uh, and, you, and you mentioned the yin and yang, that yeah. same thing that everything is, is uh, everything is dualistic, uh, like the the checkerboard, you know, that you've got the black and white, black and white, black and white. Everything is mingled in together, and of course, the Kabbalistic tree, where you've got you've got two pillars, uh, the good pillar, the bad pillar, for sake of argument, and the, the central pillar, the pillar of equilibrium. And if you think everything everything has got a everything has got two sides to it, uh, everything has got a good and a bad or an up and a down, a black and a white, uh, an in and an out. So the idea that every single thing in creation has got, it's as if creation is the drawing apart of one thing to make it an extension. So everything lies somewhere between uh, this side and that side, absolutely everything. Uh, so the idea is recognising this and recognising like, it's like, <laughs> just, <laughs> I was just going to say, that, like you know the cartoon where you get the devil on your shoulder, and you've got the and you've got the um, the angel on the other side. Well, that's that is that idea because you're in the middle. I just realised I have got the devil on my shoulder. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> the devil is from uh, Renle Chateau. There we go. That was weird, wasn't it? Uh, but, uh, the, thing is, the, the the thing is with the 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 jewelist thing when you said the devil, the the Christians had to create the devil. And the genocide of the Cathars probably wouldn't have been possible without this creation of a devil. Within Orthodox, within Orthodox Judaism, where Christianity comes from, the first five books of the Torah, there is, um, there's no devil. There's no devil in Orthodox Judaism. It's because God, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, is seen as both evil and good in equal measure. And a lot of the, you see these rabbis are constantly, quote, appeasing, they're constantly appeasing Yahweh to stop him from destroying humanity because they're aware he's as evil as he is good. So you have the Judas concept in that. Now, mm. because Christianity pulled away from Judaism or just was a new version of Judaism, they didn't have they 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 needed they needed because of proselytizing, which which Jews don't do, Muslims and Christians do the forced conversion or the conversion of others. They needed to create a sense of separation. So the devil was only invented about the Christian church only about a thousand years ago, and who was a very crude version of the the opposite of dualism. And things like um, the, what they did to the Cathars wouldn't have been possible without it. They had to create a you know an archetypal supreme bad guy that they could apply as a badge to bad what they determined bad guys were on this earth. Yeah, it was actually the Cathars that were trying to answer that question. Because they, they, the Cathars said that it was that Jawe, it was the, the what they called the, the evil um, God of the Old Testament that is this evil creator of the world. Yeah. And, uh, so, it's, uh, so they were actually trying to answer the question. Yeah, so that evil Jawe was the, the evil creator of the world and the God of the New Testament was the god of Christianity, and they were, they made this separation, which of course separate, which, which meant they were absolutely loggerheads to the the, the uh, Orthodox Church at the time, uh, because they were they were saying that evil uh, is a separate entity. Yeah, were there were the were the, um, the Cathars? Well, they were saying it's a separate entity as well, but they were trying to get out of it. The way they fought, found their way to get out was to because they thought they thought they were caught in a, yeah. a spiral of uh, reincarnation and they had to they had to uh, break this break this uh, spiral this spiral of reincarnation by um, what was the name of the um, by doing a, a, a ceremony anyway uh, which yeah. I can't remember of and then that means that they would live a good life and then they would be able to get out so really the whole idea is this world was a pit of evil a prison was they got their yeah. from Gnostics, the, the the whole thing and the, the escaping of um, you know this is why the Gnostics and 
I'm a bit iffy on them because people talk about how spiritual they are. But basically, they considered the, the, the Sert to be a horrible place. And yeah. death was the only, the only possible escape. Where the when the Bogomils and then came along and then the Cathars, they refined that concept better to cycles of reincarnation. Yeah, mm. similar thing in, uh, in 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 Vedic and Hinduism. This, you can actually stop your cycle of of uh, of uh, reincarnation if you want, but it, you have to become like a great you know a great yogi and stuff like that to do it. Otherwise, you're stuck in this cycle of of reincarnation which most hindus gladly accept because it's considered a continuous learning process oh, yeah, the, whole, uh, yeah. the dualism shows everywhere though doesn't it okay you have like, you look at the bible the, the old testament you have in genesis you have uh, moses's sons the you know the two boys uh, cain and abel there's a conflict there you have later on the prodigal sons that that was a similar idea you had Castor and Pollux in the pagan tradition. You had Athena and Arishane in the classical pagan thing. And in the, the Norse mythology, you have Loki and Thor. Yeah, it's, it's always there, you know, isn't it? It, it shows up everywhere. It shows up everywhere. And the yin yeah. and yang like that. It's, that. it's that age old thing, isn't it? Because everybody wants to work out. But I think the idea of, of uh, duality saying, okay, everything is an extension, one thing or one side, and we're in the, or in the middle. And you, and you can go from either side, long, you, long as you try to bring yourself more or less back to the centre. But then you're saying, okay, in that case, all the evil is in, is in me as much as good. And once you recognise that, it really does make things kind of clear. Because you're saying that, because you can recognise it, you can, you, you can, and then you can have an idea or a thought, which is evil, and you recognise it as evil, and instead of beating yourself up, you say, no, no, I'm not going to do that. That's wrong. I'm going to bring myself back to the centre again. Because I tell you, if you go over to the, the other side of too good, that can be just as hurtful and damaging uh, as, being, as being too bad. You know, yeah. it's trying to get yourself in the centre that's important. Yeah, and this is, uh, it, it's also, if you go, it, it, this is why the importance of the ego. The ego is the mechanism that allows you to, it's almost like the scales in Libra. It allows you to balance the two sides. That's the important part of the ego. Mm. The ego is the self-reference of, of you as yourself in the material world, which, of course, you have your spiritual identity as well. And these sort of new age concepts of killing the ego are extremely dangerous. They come out of oh, things God, like yeah. misinterpretation, oh, yeah. misinterpretation of Buddhism. The purpose of, they're not, Buddhists don't kill the ego. What they're trying to do is stop the, the cycle of reincarnation. Somehow Western Western versions of this completely twisted around to say you've got to kill the ego. And that was a kind of a, a very damaging and terrifying thing because this is where direct soul loss comes from. And that's what I was just saying earlier on about how totalitarian re re regimes demolish the sense of self by saying there's no separation between you and the other comrade and so on. It's the same thing in New Age. There's no step. We're all one. No, we're not all one. We're not. We're, the, the Hindus are correct on this. We are, you know, a million eyes of God observing itself, building creation, coming trillion eyes of god you know observing itself through cre the creation the manifestation of creation that's couldn't be any clearer i don't think and you have these situations too where where people they don't develop the sense of sight the sense of psychic integration and self and this is where a lot of these kind of i think today you have so many of these npc types these people that they've been shown now that they don't literally have a an internal dialogue or an internal world this, again, coming from the notion that they've killed themselves at the soul level. In indigenous society, these would have been pe people that were considered to have a soul loss, that they were complete robots following the, the mandates of the, the culture around them, that they switched off. And this whole thing of the NPC and the, uh, the whole world of these people don't have internal dialogue. Some of the, the, they have support message boards and reading them is just fascinating. You hear, you'll read people say things like, Oh, I, I can remember I used to have an internal monologue until I went to university. And when I graduated <laughs> university, it was gone, which shows you that there was a destruction of the integration of the self. They were molded in the, in, in the, uh, in the ethos mm. of the professor or the, uh, the, the philosophy of the faculty of the university. And this is, uh, this is something, this, is, this would be considered soul loss. If you go to the African tribes, again, this is a big, the, the indigenous African spiritual tradition is very greatly concerned with the concept of soul loss. It must not be lost at any, 
at any level. It, it has to be, or it is lost. The, the, the process of the shaman or the priest is immediately to help you regain your soul. And we've lost that in the West because mm. of things, well, things like empires and education and systems to the point where we don't value or cherish the, 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 the sacredness and the identity of the personal soul. And duality, dualism is a huge part of helping you maintain this uh, because of yeah. philosophical trajectory will come back to, well, I, I know I'm a Marxist and he's, he's a, he's a, he's a right winger. I say, I'm a, uh, at the end of the day, I'm no different than him. We've just assumed different versions of it. And that's true enlightenment. You know, that's what, yeah, the, yeah. what, the, what, the, what the, the Demarouge wants is the two forces constantly fighting. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm left wing. He's right wing. I'm left wing. We're out there, but we're true enlightenment is coming together and understand he's me. You, I am. you meet people, don't you, who have, I mean, religion, politics, or just general watching the television. You know, being done. You meet people, and you know, you don't actually meet them because they'll say, "Hello, I'm such and such a thing." They say, "You know, you don't really have to carry on the conversation because you know everything they believe, every every response they're going to give you, because they've never actually thought of one themselves, and that that is the shame because dualistic thinking teaches you to go on these journeys of of self discovery. When I talk, when I um, when I call myself sort of a, a Gnostic, that the idea is that I, well, I'm not a real Gnostic, but the Gnostic, the idea of building up my um, understanding of whatever the deity is and whatever I am, and you learn and you learn and you learn yourself rather than just being told from external sources what you're going to believe. So if you meet if you meet them if you meet somebody who say I don't know, somebody's into Marxism. You know what they're going to say, don't you? You know their answers to everything. And, and that means to me, you've read a book, but you've never thought anything. No. Well, you've watched, and like a good friend down in Cork who sent me an email this morning, and he said that uh, he was clocking off work yesterday, and the guy said, I'll see you in the new year. And then he started going through on his phone the deaths of how many people died of COVID in Ireland. Or oh, did you see so many died? And my friend turned around and said, I wish I wish killed me so I didn't have to hear you anymore. And he said it was it was, it was very liberating. You know, yeah. it was very liberating. And uh, he goes, that, that's, he says, from now on, that's what I'm going to do. Oh, I hope it kills me. And he's got a good point because he's kind of taken, the, these people are terrified of it. They see yeah. it as this, this monster that's coming together. I know. I know. Like the, yesterday in Ireland, the guy, I, I mean, I'm amazed by the... Uh, the, the behavior of people. Yesterday in Ireland, a, a hunter was killed by a stag, right? And this fellas living in the center of Irish city saying, Oh, we, we have to watch deer, they're really dangerous. I'm really, they're afraid of deer because one guy was <laughs> you know, the, and that, not reindeer, I hope, at Christmas. <laughs> yeah, rain. I thought it was kind of symbolic too that you know the, the reindeer killed the, the hunter. It was almost like I thought, oh, I thought actually I, I'm not making fun of the man's death or anything, but I thought that was very symbolic that the horned god uh <laughs> the yeah. horn god at, 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 at a, you know this time of year making a comeback you know because the horn god is integral to the the dualistic state of paganism as well you you know and it, that's it, one of the good thing one of the few good things that neo pagans have brought through is the female moon goddess and the uh, the male horn god and you'll often see the kind of the symbolism of the full moon in the middle of the antlers of the horn god you know that's real interesting stuff too as well. That's it. That that's like European paganism dualism, the male and female nature gods. Yeah, yeah, it's all fascinating stuff, isn't it? I mean, and then I was just thinking, uh, all this whole idea of transferring evil to an external source, um, yeah. and thinking and not realizing that it's with you. I mean. It's a way of making yourself feel um, without confronting it. I mean, like, I, to think about the German guards in the in the uh, in, in Auschwitz. Auschwitz. Um, if you ask somebody like, "Would you?" These these guards were evil, weren't they? So, well, would you have done it if you were if you were there? Would you have put some Jewish people onto a train, knowing that they were going to be gassed? Well, of course I wouldn't. No, that's evil. Well. 
have you ever really thought deep down that if you're in that situation, uh, whether you would do that or not? And uh, I would say that a lot of people would have done that in that situation. Oh, well, the, mil the Milgram experiment proves that. You know, yeah, people, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll yeah. just follow orders. They'll just follow up. And like when those, 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 uh, those people were being tried at the Nuremberg trials, they were, when they were saying things like, when I was just following orders, yeah. they were absolutely telling the truth. They were not lying. They were being quite honest. They were just, they had, they, they had switched themselves into a state of dissociation. See, a way of escaping the, this kind of, this moral battleground, this, 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 as you said, the devil on one and the angel on the other, is to go into a state of dissociation where you're out from it. So you're, no, you're in a different mind where this is no longer a point. And that's what happens. That's what the Milgram experiment and the, the place like Auschwitz teach us and the SS and so on, is that they go into a state of dissociation where they can do these appalling things and then go home to their family in the evening and, you oh, know, exactly, yeah. their kids after they've been doing atrocious things to other people's kids. You know, it's Which just, it's a great. I would love to have, you know, the, one of the great things that's lost in history is I bet there was tremendous conversations between the first Christians. Remember there was numerous Christian sects mm. in the early days of Christianity uh, before Pauline Christianity became the dominant one that made it a Vatican. But, but yeah. there would have been, there was many, many Christian and Gnostic sects. They must have had some fantastic discussions and debates with the pagan priests at the, like the temple of Jupiter and stuff like that about their own yeah. different, Philosophic, it's all been lost. It's just oh. the whole thing. This is one of the reasons the great tragedies of Irish history is we simply don't know the, the, the record of the Roman. We don't, we just don't know anything about the Roman connection with Ireland other than Tacticus, you know, wrote quite a fair bit about it and said that the, our, Rome and Ireland were well, well known to each other. But could you imagine there would have been amazing dialogues between the the Druids and say the 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 Romans. Well, the, the, the definitely was. Um, there was some of the early early um, early church people actually said, didn't they? That Jesus is my Druid. I can't remember which one it was because I think um, that the teachings came across from the Middle East and melded in really well because the basis of Christianity is really really good, isn't it? Uh, I mean, some of the things are just. Well, but the basic teachings there underneath, especially on the esoteric level, are brilliant. And they would have fed in to the, the pagan beliefs perfectly. And we ended up with the Christian Celtic Church, didn't we? Or the Celtic Christian Church, which, well, it, which thrived it, in Britain and Ireland for a long time. It was. Yeah. It was, it was uh, we, it's, it's still very mysterious. We don't know a lot about it. But what is interesting is that Actually, when Catholicism came along later, it actually got a bit more pagan. I think that's like when the Dakar Bears were probably dug up and accepted because <laughs> yeah. they, they Catholicism was basically a compromise where they said, you know, we'll never get rid of paganism. We might start bringing it, bringing it in. And that's where Christian Christmas and uh, Easter and so on came from. But England and Wales are fantastic places for this kind of stuff. There's um, all kinds of pagan idols from the Roman period and you know, we don't know what the Dakar Bears are, but they're probably even pre that in English and Welsh churches. And, and even, you know, you look at, you look at, there's a church, there's a very large church uh, it, that I was in there in near Wrexham. And it has on the altar, a statue of the goddess Nemesis, the Greek goddess Nemesis that had been deliberately brought into the church mm. because, you know, to get this connection between the two and you get a lot, there's a lot more of that in, mainly because the Romans were there and they weren't really in Ireland. But there's a lot more of that in England and Wales than there is just about anywhere else, where literally the taking of pagan gods and goddesses and literally put into the early Christian churches, is, I find that stuff fascinating. Absolutely yeah, you see them all over, don't you? You do. Yeah. I mean, the melding, I think, the the pagan beliefs and the Christian beliefs were, quite, were probably fundamental. I mean, people, you can't just change something overnight and say, right, you're going to stop being that, and you're going to be this now. I mean, the Pendle yeah. Witches have proved that. But uh, I think it was only... So there must have been a, a lot, a very tolerant a, a, attitude to the Christian. Rather, it was a, a welcome... Oh, oh that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, I never thought that. Yeah, let's add that on. Until, I think it was at 666 at uh, um, the, the, uh, the Synod of Whitby, 
when suddenly yeah. the Catholic Church then was predominant. Yeah, but the, if you look at the read books like Catra Nixie's The Dark and the Age, there's the, the pagans were very tolerant to the Christians. Uh, they gave them full religious freedom after they basically lobbied for it. And they had no problem with Christianity, just like Hindus have no problem with Christianity. And but unfortunately, elements arose then within the Vatican, within well within the Middle East. It actually started in places like Syria, and you had these fanatical zealot Christians who basically eventually took over the Roman Empire and became what we call the Vatican today. But again, there were so many different strands of early Christianity that are. Uh, far w- would have if Pauline Christianity had been written to prominence, probably would have a very very different version of what Christianity is today. And uh, I don't know it would have been better or worse or anything like that, but it definitely would have been infused with more of these mystery school elements that you, you yourself talk about. Yeah, because uh, it was. I mean, the mystery schools had to go underground, didn't they? Really, but if they had been melded in as they were originally, I think. With the Christian church, it would have lasted because it would have been a lot. It would have been a lot more relevant for people, rather than just being an authoritarian. Um, this is what you all believe, blah blah blah. And it's the churches seem to take away from you your your spirituality by saying rather than work it on it yourself. And you know, this guy over here, the guy with the frock on there, he'll do it for you. Don't bother about you know the the priest or whatever, he'll do your spirituality. You just get on with your work, you know. So that's probably why we ended up with the NCP sort of idea, because people have no need to build their own spirits and their own soul, because they're yeah. letting someone else do it for them. And that's useful to the autocratic structures. What you're saying then about the mystery schools going on the ground, this is why so many pagan statues were, you know, pagan gods were found, have been found buried. They were deliberately buried as Christianity was rising because the Christians were attacking them with hammers and things like that. That's why so many don't have noses. And, it would uh, focus your mind, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, so they, they buried them under the ground. And it was also kind of a code that like, we as the pagan world, as the classical pagan world, were not gone. We're underground. We're underground. What you said became the mystery schools and then became things like uh, later on Freemasonry and so mm. on. Like all yeah. came out of that, the, the, you know, these, these, the, the secret unknowns, as, as, uh, it was, as they were called in uh, The Godfather 3, which was oh, uh, very, yeah, yeah. very I love interesting. That. Oh, that, that I was funny. I, I got, well, my philosophy of now New Year's Eve special, I talk about The Godfather 3. It's a, it's a greatly overlooked film in terms of whistleblowing. You're supposed to um, say, it's not the best one, you know. Oh, no, because... You've got to say with... that. I don't necessarily believe it, but you have to say that, don't you? Oh, one and two were far better. <laughs> oh, they are far better, but the third one, if the third one had nothing to do with the first two, it'd be a great standalone movie. I tell you, it's better. you know, it's, that, it's uh, better. that whole idea, that whole oh, idea of good and evil, you know, yeah. when they go through and the the the, 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 uh, the, uh, the opera, and there's yeah. like a spiritual opera, but in the background, the the... the we're settling all debts. We're settling all family debts. And uh, yeah. so people are being killed, flashed through the eye, being murdered, and they're all like celebrating this beautiful opera. It's the, the, the opposite of the good and the evil there, isn't it? I, I yeah. love that, the way they do that. The whole Godfather trilogy is the fool's journey from Michael Corleone. You know, that's him. That's, it's, if you look at those yeah, three yeah. films, it's it, it. I mean, pe- people say, "Oh, great spiritual movies." You want to see? You want to see great spiritual movie series? Watch The Godfather. Mm-hmm. It, watch Michael Corleone represents the absolute soul of man in the material world, and oh, you know, so. not an evil man. He's not a, a brutal, vicious man. He's just a soul. Uh, you know, an agent of fortune caught in a world where he's trying to do the right thing. Even yeah, though yeah. he was murdering people and stuff like that, it's very powerful. I, 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 mm-hmm. I, I tell people over the any time over the holiday, watch the three Godfather movies and and look at them not as gangster movies but as philosophical treaties. It's that thing, isn't it? Where we've said before, people are like introducing these lockdowns now. We see them as evil, but they go home and they've got children and they've got a wife and they've got a family that they, that they love so but and it's the same as Carly isn't it, isn't it the family that 
he uh, he would go out and he, he murdered his own brother and he he would do such incredible evil things, but he was only trying to do the right thing. And it's that it's that dualistic thing again, isn't it? You've got one side, you've got the other side, and how do you find a middle road? Because even at the end of his life, he said he said yeah. he didn't work out what what he what he'd done wrong, did he? <laughs> he never got it. In the third film, when he gives confession to the priest, and it, it doesn't resolve anything until he says, "I murdered my own brother. I had my yeah. own brother killed." And, and then he let he that had, out. Yeah. There had to be a transference. There had to be a, a karmic payback. I won't tell. I won't. At the end of the film, he gets his karmic payback. I won't tell anybody what happens, but it's like a classic. It's a classic mythology. You know, it's true that Godfather Three film deserves a lot more respect than it gets. It really does, uh, because and it, I remember when that first came out, I was all eager to see it because I loved the first two films, and yeah. all the reviewers were all like, "Oh, it's conspiracy theory nonsense." No, if you read Michael, if you read uh, David Yallops in God's Name, it's not conspiracy theory nonsense. All that stuff really did happen. Well, the P two Church and all the, the brothers, yeah. yeah, absolutely, it's true. Or as Andy Garcia in the film calls him, the secret unknowns. I thought that was I thought that was sublime. He didn't say Illuminati like he did in the, the Da Vinci Code. He said the secret unknowns. And I've decided from now on to use that term myself to describe the, the, the magicians behind the veil, the secret unknowns. I thought that was a masterstroke giving him that name rather than calling them the Illuminati. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, the Illuminati is a silly name anyway, isn't it? Because it only lasted yeah, for a very short period of time. <laughs> they've been obsolete for 200 years so yeah exactly yeah it was a Y shaft wasn't it but it 18 whatever it only lasted that particular organisation was only yeah. uh, oh, was infiltrate the, the Grand Orient Lodge in Paris once that was done the job mm. was done that was the end of it yeah so how long have we been talking for now I, I, I didn't look at my I, I think that's a wrap anyway yeah I think, I think we've got to the end of today's uh, yeah. So, uh, well, we talked about the cathars, and I'm, this is my next move. Yep. I'm not, I, didn't get, I didn't get to the longer dock this year, but I right. love the, doing my cathar tour. So next year, hopefully, I'll be able to do two. But well, this is what well, this is my next move. Command de la Mou, from the right, right from the the cathar country. This is my fizzy. So that's where I'm. That's my next stop. Is that a fizz of sparkling wine or something? Yeah, Do you know the, the sparkling wine started. I mean, this is obviously off subject, but do you know like the Knights Templar came out of the Court of Champagne? Yeah, and they were going to. I've just I've done my uh, um, Templar Knights Templar series on my web, on my YouTube channel. But they, they they started. They came out of the Court of Champagne, the Knights Templar, and they were going to settle in the Longer Dock to be their home to be their homeland. That's what they wanted at one point. So the first champagne is not champagne. It's actually the uh, the Cremons and Lemus uh, of the Languedoc. Cremont and what's the other? Blanquettes of the Languedoc. Those were the first fizzy wine because you can see the connection between the Champagne area and down the, down on the coast in the Languedoc where the Templars wanted to settle. So the first wine, was, the fizzy wine was down there before Champagne. That's interesting about the, the connection of wine because the most temper region, temper saturated region in Ireland is Waterford and Kilkenny. And they were the ports where they, well, New Ross, where they imported all the wine into Ireland. And that's also where all the tempers ended up after the, you know, the Philip II nuns that carry on. That's interesting too, how wine is central to them. Well, you enjoy that. I'm going to be having some West Indian porter. So we've covered everything. Yeah, well, yeah, everything. right around the world. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And, uh, that's that. I'm absolutely. It's lovely that actually. And uh, so uh, I wish you and the uh, the viewers a happy new year. And we'll see yeah. you probably, and we'll be on to the magician. So if you have absolutely. a car, a tarot deck, get out your fool card today. Think about what we're saying. And uh, we've now passed into dualism, and now we're going to look at the magician and his material toolkit in the next one. So absolutely, happy, yeah. Happy New Year, everybody. And 2021, it's already been brilliant. It's already we've already made it brilliant. I'm not going to. Yeah, we're going to do. It. Yeah, it's going to. It can't be anywhere. It's going to be great. Yeah, happy New Year to you, Thomas, and uh, happy New Year to all you guys out there. And we'll see you in, well, in the new year. Yeah. 
And and uh, don't forget my Velocity of Now show tonight at 10, 10 p.m. 10 p.m. Brilliant. We okay. You. See you guys. See you all. Cheers, Bye. Man.